Well, because of time, and we had a few extra things today, like baptisms and graduations, I'm going to skip what I was going to do with the, the whiteboard. I'm just going to ask you to, to help me uh, here in just a few moments. You can just do it verbally and instead of writing them down. We'll just, we'll just do it out loud. But uh, some of you remember in 2009, um, if you were here that long, I actually went through a period. It was a culmination of some uh, uh, inner healing, emotional stuff that I was kind of getting healed of and some things the Lord was taking care of in my own heart. And it actually led to some physical healing in the sense that it motivated me to take care of my physical health too. And so I think from January to May of that year, I lost 65 pounds. Um, <coughs> I lost it and I've, I've since found quite a bit of it. Uh, but uh, uh, but it was, I, just, I didn't do anything crazy. I just exercised. I I exercised when, even when I was, had already exercised, like, so I'd exercise in the morning every day, but then, like, I would be sitting at home, and thoughts hit me that had never hit me before in my life, like, I should go for a jog. I don't think I've ever had that thought, you know, before, like, <laughs> free time never equaled exercise time in my brain, but it did then. I would eat one uh, helping instead of seconds or thirds. Uh, I snacked healthy, you know, and so I lost, I lost that weight. And so uh, that really set me on a journey. Now, just let's do this out loud and do it fairly quickly. If you were to say, like, what are the kind of things you would do that lead to physical health, um, what, would, what would you say? What, what is, like, if you're going to list some things for physical health, what would you say? Say it out loud. Water. Drinking lots of water is, is important for physical health. Other things. Working out. Somebody said in the back. Sleep. Sleep's very important. Walking. What? Sports. Yeah, just being involved in some sports, group activities, some others, healthy activities. Swimming. Playing with the grandchildren. Absolutely. That'll wear you down. So, yeah. Dieting. Yeah, just having a good diet, a healthy diet, nothing fad, just actually something that's workable. How about unhealthy? Let's switch real quick. If you were to develop a list, what's unhealthy? Junk food. What? Beer. Beer. Yes. Stress. Stress. So many things I want to say and I'm not. Uh, somebody else. Overeating. Fast food. Overeating. Smoking. Smoking. Sitting like a sedentary lifestyle, right? Somebody else said something? Couch potatoes. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we have these lists, and we know that they're, they're not uh, compatible. We know that, that they, don't, they don't go together, those two things. If you, if you live one, then you're not living the other. So if you're doing everything on the physical side and you have physical health, you might, you know, sit and be a couch potato one day, and you can, you can, you can still have a healthy lifestyle, right? But if you're like a couch potato for 45 days in a row, you probably have moved off the healthy lifestyle thing, right? Well, I want us to finish up our Holy Spirit series today, and we're going to talk about over the last eight weeks, we've had just phenomenal experiences with the Holy Spirit, haven't we? I mean, just God has shown up. Some of you heard the voice of the Holy Spirit for the first time. Others of you, it's the first time you've actually taken some real action in, with the Holy Spirit, like uh, during the encouragement exercise we did one, one Sunday here. You, many of you got up and walked over to somebody that you may have not even known and said, I think the Lord has an encouraging word for you. And so you've seen the Holy Spirit move in your life, and it's been very exciting. I, I, got a, I got an email from a gentleman. I asked him if I could share part of it. Uh, he, got a, uh, he sent me an email this week just saying, man, just had an incredible experience last week on Sunday. I was, you know, during ministry time, we were waiting on the Lord. He said, I had my hand on the, on the, on the back of my girlfriend's back, and, and she didn't know it, but I was actually praying for her. And uh, she turned to me and just said, are, are you praying for me? And he goes, well, yes. And she goes, keep doing it. I, I can feel like healing happening. Um, she said, I could feel power coming from his hand as he prayed. And this was like the first time he'd experienced that. He told me in his email, I could feel God working through me. Just thinking about it makes my body feel amazing and emotional and a million other emotions. I want to have those kind of feelings on a daily basis outside of the church. I don't know why I had to go into all de this detail for you about everything, um, but I just want more of that in my life. So, what how could we have more of that in our life? How could, how could we begin to string together these kind of things? Not just on Sundays during ministry time and worship, not just at small group. How could we begin to string together these kind of Holy Spirit experiences? And if we actually did begin to string them together, what would be the result of our life? 
If you string together regular exercise, uh, healthy eating, uh, proper sleep, drinking the right amount of water, you string that together, you end up with a physically healthy life. Well, what kind of things could we expect to happen if we string together Holy Spirit experiences? Well, I want to answer that question today and show us how to to have more of the Spirit in our lives as we wrap up this series. Uh, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians uh, is a book that, um, unlike a lot of the other letters that the missionary Paul wrote, this letter isn't just written to one church. It's actually written to a group of churches in a region. It would would kind of be like saying... um, to the churches of the state of Ohio. You know, it's, it's to a big group. And uh, it's in what we would call central Turkey, um, kind of Asia Minor, right, getting into Europe. And um, he writes a group of churches that all these people had come out of pretty pagan lifestyles, idol worship, all these kind of things. And they come out of this, these, these lifestyles where they didn't know the true God at all. And they had radical conversions to Jesus. In fact, as you read the book of Galatians, you see that the Holy Spirit was coming in power. He'd come in so much power on them that Paul regularly would refer to, is, you know, remember the experiences you're having week after week, that you see miracles happen in your midst all the time, or that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, or they they had such great experiences with God, they were now calling God Daddy. They said, you, you, the Spirit has put the spirit of like fatherhood in you. Like, you believe that God's your father so much you're calling him Daddy God. And so they had these rich experiences in the book of Galatian, but or in the churches of Galatia. But something odd had happened is some, I think, probably well-meaning people showed up who were very religious. They were people who had been Jews and faithfully served God as, as, as God's people, the Jews. And then they began to realize that Jesus was the Messiah. And they still retained their, their Jewishness, which was, which was fine. But one thing they began to do is they began to force their Jewishness on others and began to teach them. They came into these churches and they taught them, you have to be a religious and cultural Jew in order for God to accept you. You have to obey all 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Uh, Not just the moral commandments, but the cultural ones. Imagine how high of a hurdle that would be for you if I brought another culture in here and said, in order for you to follow Jesus, you have to become them. 14 years ago, some of us went to Kenya and we got to hang out almost every day with Maasai tribesmen, kind of the colorful sash, girdle thing. I, I wouldn't tell them as a girdle because they had spears that hit me, but that, it was kind of this dress thing. And, um, you know, big earrings, sometimes, you know, gauges in and looping earlobes and stuff. What if I brought one of them up and I said, in order to be accepted by God, you have to dress like them, eat like them, talk like them, learn their language. It would be a hurdle, wouldn't it? Not only would it be a hurdle, it would be a stumbling block to actually come to know Jesus. The other thing that might begin to happen in your thinking would be, if I dress like them and eat like them and I get accepted by God, then I've done the heavy lifting to be accepted by God. I did all these works to get saved. If you know anything about Paul, he hates that kind of talk. And so he just comes after him and says, you didn't get saved that way. You got saved by grace. You were a mess. You were broken. You were evil. You were sinful. You were dirty. You were stained. And God just saved you. You just said, I trust Jesus. And that wasn't even a work because Jesus gave you the ability to do that. And he just poured his grace and mercy out on you. And you got saved. Not only that, remember all the miracles. Remember the outpourings of the Holy Spirit you're, you're experiencing week after week in your gatherings and in your personal life. You have been saved by grace. You have been set free from the law. Your your, your relationship with God is no longer dictated by rules and guidelines. Now, we can learn a ton from the principles of the rules and guidelines, can't we? But Paul said, you've been set free, and you've not been set free to live however you want, to just live willy-nilly, or to just be selfish, or to, to just give in to your own desires. You have been set free to love and to serve. So here's the problem if you live by guidelines and rules. I can actually be less loving if I live by guidelines and rules because I can say, well, I've done enough loving and and serving things towards Tom. I can check those guidelines off and I'm done. I don't have to serve him anymore. I don't have to love him anymore. But all those rules are God's rules. Yep. But I'm so sinful, I can turn God's rules around and twist them in such a way that gets me off the hook from serving and loving Tom, which would not be the reason for God's rules, right? Paul says, you've been set free from the rules so you can go above and beyond to love and to serve. After he says that, he begins to get into what does it look like 
to string together enough spirit experiences, what could you expect to look like if you, if you lived that way? So let's take a look at that, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We're going to keep going, but let's, take a, let's stop here. First, a glossary of terms. The word walk in the Bible, both used by the Hebrews and by people who wrote in Greek, which is the authors of the New Testament, the word walk, um, what they thought of walk, it became a metaphor for living. So when you walk, you take constant steps, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. That became a metaphor for the way you constantly live, like what characterizes the way that you live. And so he says, if you walk by the Spirit, yes, Holy Spirit, right foot. Yes, left foot. Yes, right foot. If you continue to say yes by the, to the Spirit, you are walking in the Spirit. And if you're walking in the Spirit, he says, you will not give in to the desires of your flesh or your sinful nature. Now, when he uses the word flesh, he's not talking about this per se. He's talking about that part of us that comes from the fallen era, that comes from pre-Christ, comes from Adam and Eve on, that has not been redeemed or set free yet. It means a sinful lifestyle or just one that doesn't belong to the kingdom. Uh, It means decisions, selfishness, conceit, pride, those things that belong to the pre-Christian era of our life. B.C., you might say, before Christ. If you keep saying yes to the Holy Spirit, Paul says, if you're saying yes, 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 and you begin walking with the Spirit, then you, you can't give in to the desires of, of the sinful nature. Now, when he says can't, he doesn't mean that you can't do something bad. You can do something bad. What he's saying is you can't walk this way and have a life characterized by this over here. Go back to our health and the thing we did. If I had time, I'd have wrote them down. It might have been a little easier. Let's just go back to that. So I can't exercise every day and eat three great meals a day that are healthy and and have a and then you know drink the water, get to sleep, do the, the things I need to do with the doctors, take medicine and follow medicine. I have a healthy lifestyle. Paul is, it's not so much that these two things would be at war, healthy lifestyle, unhealthy lifestyle. The, the conflict he's talking about is not so much they're in conflict because they're at war. It, they're in conflict because they're incompatible. I can't live on pork rinds and watch uh, TV and play video games 12 hours a day, every day, and say, I have a healthy lifestyle. Why? They're incompatible. They're not at war. They're not in conflict that way. They're in conflict because they're, they're incompatible. On the other hand, I can't give in to the sinful nature all the time and do the desires that I want to do in my fallenness and say I'm walking with the Spirit. They, they just don't go hand in hand. I know, I know it's not rocket science. It's actually pretty easy. But, you know, if I live unhealthy, I can't say I have a healthy lifestyle. Like, I'm never going to be able to get a journal article published by saying research discovers that unhealthy living is incompatible with healthy living. Like, we'd be like, well, duh. They don't take much research. They don't go together. It's the same spiritually. You can't have a lifestyle that is characterized by giving in to what I want to do as a sinful person and at the same time have a lifestyle that says I'm walking with the Spirit. Paul says they're simply incompatible. They don't go together. I can't dabble in the Holy Spirit once a week or once a month or once a year and expect to be healthy. But if I will string together enough Holy Spirit experiences of yes, yes, I'll do what you say, yes, I'll do what you say, yes, I'll do what you say, yes, I'll do it. If I begin to string enough of those together, before you know it, I will have a healthy spiritual life. Now, Paul knows that we might not totally get what's it mean to say yes. Like, what should we say no to and what should we say yes to? Take a look at, um, take a look at uh, verse 19. 
Paul lists. This is, in a, this is in a comprehensive list, by the way. This doesn't cover every wrong thing. It probably just covers the wrong things that, that are for, uh, I mean, for everybody, but it's, it happens to be the wrong things for what the Galatians were going through. Like, this is probably their list that he knows they struggle with this, so he just wants to make sure they understand these things don't belong to walking in the Spirit. I, I want to tell you this, too. When we go over this list and the list about the Holy Spirit, remember we always like looking at it as individuals. This wasn't an individual thing. This was to a community of churches. And if you remember the context I set this up with, he was saying, you're free to love and serve. All of this is about relationship, all about having healthy community. This isn't just about me being an individual good Christian, although it takes individual good Christians to make good Christian community. But it's more, these are about, here's the things that break down our walk with Christ and our walk with each other. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not enter or inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, we're talking about a life character. It doesn't mean that you stumble and, and do one of these like you get jealous, you have a fit of rage, you do something that would be classified as sexual immorality. If you have like one or two actions, it's not saying that that characterizes your life. What Paul is saying, if you have a life that's characterized by, by walking in the Spirit, you won't have a life characterized by these. You might slip, you might sin, but your life won't be characterized by that. Conversely, if you have a life that's just characterized by dissension, by just causing discord in people's lives, Paul would say, well, if that's what characterizes your life, then you're not walking by the Spirit. They're incompatible. Does that make sense? They do not go together. Sexual immorality in the, in the, in the New Testament, the words that are being used there, it just simply means anything outside of God's design going all the way back to creation of one man, one woman, and, and marriage. And that nails about all of us, doesn't it? Lust, pornography, Affairs, using sex to gratify ourselves instead of our, our mate. I mean, there's all, you can just go down a list, right? Same sex. I mean, we just go down in our culture. There's just all of us. This just nails us all. Debauchery, the word debauchery, not a word we use a lot, but debauchery in that list just simply means there's no more shame about ever, anything as far as sexual sin. It's just out in the open celebrated, and I mean, you see that in the entertainment industry, right? There's no shame anymore about anything. Multiple partners, multiple spouses, multiple, I mean, just, there's no shame, just boom. And then we get into more. These are things that break relationships, right? It's not just individual sins. It's break, they break relationship, envy, jealousy, drunkenness. That's not just a personal thing, is it? That often breaks relationships, doesn't it? Community. All these things, fits of rage, Selfish ambition, that's not just a personal sin. Selfish ambition tramples other people, right? Hurts community. Paul says, you can't live like that. You can't have a life that's characterized by selfish ambition and expect to be walking with the Spirit. They do not go together. You can't have a life that, that is characterized by sexual immorality or drunkenness or a fit of rage. You can't be just known as, man, that person is always an angry person. Paul would say, well, if that's what your life's characterized by, then you are not walking in the Spirit. Idolatry is putting anyone or anything above God. Sports, work, people's opinions. Go down the list. Witchcraft in the Bible. Witchcraft's an interesting word. The word here for witchcraft is pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy, and it means that drugs were being used to connect with the spirit world. Think that's happening today? Paul says you can't live like this as a characteristic of your life. If your life is characterized by those things, then you are not inheriting the kingdom of God and you're not living by the Spirit or walking with the Spirit. 
We have a choice. We have been set free from those things, and we now have a choice to say yes or no to those desires. We are no longer passive participants, but we can actively say no to the sinful desires and say yes to the Holy Spirit. Now again, verse 21 doesn't mean we won't occasionally say yes to the wrong desires. No more than an incredibly healthy person won't go to the fair and eat a deep-fried Twinkie once a year, right? Doesn't mean that they're unhealthy. They just had one unhealthy choice, right? But you can't have a life characterized by sinful desires or fleshly desires or to uh, choices or relational choices in, in, in how we deal with people. Uh, you can't have that that is more characteristic of the pre-Christian life and say, I'm walking with the Spirit. They simply do not go hand in hand. Saying yes to what my flesh desires won't lead to the kind of life the Spirit desires. But what if I say yes to the Spirit over and over? What if every time there's an opportunity to get prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I say yes? What if when the Holy Spirit nudges me to unload the dishwasher, even though it's not my turn, uh, what happens if I say yes to that? What happens if I say yes tomorrow and I'm at the 7170 split and I want to yell at the driver and I say yes to the spirit that says, don't yell? And I go, okay. What happens if I keep saying yes to the nudges of the Holy Spirit? Look at the kind of life you can expect. Take a look at verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Like you can't say a rule and go, well, you should only love this far. You should only have this much peace. There's no law against that, right? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. All too often, I think we read these verses and heard them in Sunday school or heard them in a teaching, and we see them as individual character things in our lives. Again, please hear me. It takes individuals who have these characteristics to create a community that has these characteristics, but all of this is about community. Like, you can't be loving on your own, right? Like, you cannot go into your bedroom or your closet and go, I am such a loving person. The only way you know you're a loving person is when you're around somebody who's who's unlovable, right? I am so peace-filled and I keep the peace all the time, but I never leave my house. Well, you're not peaceful. You're just alone. You need to go find somebody who's chaotic and figure out if you still have peace and if you bring peace to the situation. We often translate the word for patience or forbearance as patience. But I don't like the word patience because, A, I don't think it's the correct translation here. But I think in our society, we have made patience an individual characteristic. That's not what this word is. Forbearance means this I will put up with another person. So I can't say I'm a very patient person, but I'm never around people who I don't like. No. I got to be around annoying people to figure out if I actually have the gift or the fruit of forbearance. And it means I will put up with you because I love you. And I want to stay in relationship with you. Paul says, if we will keep saying yes to the Holy Spirit, yes, I'll unload the dishwasher. Yes, I I won't yell at somebody on the highway. Yes, I'll pray for the person you want me to. Yes, I'll say the encouraging word. Yes, I'll receive prayer again for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I'll engage in worship even when I don't feel like it. Yes, yes, yes. As we begin to say yes to the nudges of the Holy Spirit, then we will begin to see this fruit in our life. And who doesn't want the kind of life the Holy Spirit desires for us to have? Imagine your home being characterized by this life, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, loyalty, stick-to-itiveness. Wouldn't that be incredible? That kind of life is the life that the Holy Spirit desires for you. Now I know there's this other desire in you I deserve to be jealous. I deserve to be angry because of what so-and-so did in my house or what my neighbor did. I deserve that. Here's the choice you have to make on the sinful list that that Paul gives. It's the same. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Are you going to trust yourself to come up with what the best kind of life is or are you going to trust God? That's really what it boils down to. Adam and Eve had a simple choice. Am I going to trust God when God says, don't eat this, it's bad for you, you will die? Am I going to trust that God... 
as pleasurable as this looks like, as much as I deserve to have this, as, as much as I might think God is a cosmic killjoy for not letting me eat of that fruit, am I going to trust that he knows what's best for me? Am I going to trust myself? That's all these sin lists are. Who am I going to trust? I deserve to be jealous. I deserve to be envious. I deserve this, this sexual fling. I deserve, you know, a fit of anger. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve to get drunk and blow off steam. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. This is, this is best for me. God doesn't know. That's what I'm saying every time I sin. God does not know what is best for me. And yet, don't when you look at that second list, like that seems like the best kind of life I could ever hope to have. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, forbearance, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I have to say yes to what the Spirit desires, and I'll end up with that fruit. Now, when I say the word fruit, don't think passivity. I think sometimes when we hear fruit of the Spirit, we think passivity. Like, I'm just going to be planted in the Holy Spirit and just be passive and rest in the Holy Spirit. And just pop, pop, fruit's going to come out, right? This is very intentional. This is, this is very active fruit. Because it's you saying no to one list and saying yes to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. It's you receiving prayer every time it's offered. It's you saying yes to the nudges of the the world when when you're, if God identifies an idol in your heart, for example, that you'll say no to that idol and say yes to making God first. Even good things in your life that, that, that are kind of neutral, work or education or money, those things, we're so twisted we can turn those into idols. And so if God puts that in your life, he, he says that's an idol, then you say no to it. It's, you know, society says so many of our desires are beneficial, whether it's pornography or premarital sex or self-gratification or promiscuity or just the, the last goes on and on. And, and yet over and over again, the word of the Lord and the teaching of Jesus and the witness of the earliest followers of him, like Paul says, God designed Sex for one place in marriage. We have to trust him that he knows what's best for us. If you like to stir the pot and cause dissension in groups, you're going to have to learn to say no to that because that's not the kind of life the Spirit desires. You have to say no to that and yes to the Holy Spirit, how he wants you to operate in relationships. Here's one thing I've learned physically. In my natural state, I don't like vegetables. My natural state, I don't like exercise. But here's a weird deal. When I start to eat right and I start to exercise, I actually like it. Isn't that weird? And it becomes more normal to me. I think the same thing comes in our life of God. That our flesh cries out to do something that's bad for us and we can't, can't even conceive of not doing this. And yet the reality is, is when I start saying yes to the Holy Spirit and I start seeing this fruit in my relationships, I all of a sudden go, that's the life I really want. Isn't that the way with you? Like what we witnessed today of baptisms and Holy Spirit falling on people and the encouragement we've had over the last eight weeks and you being used by God to encourage or bless somebody else or give a word that helps them. I mean, that's like the best kind of life you could desire. Saying yes to what my old self desires won't lead to the life the Spirit desires, and yet what the life that the Spirit desires is really the life I really want. Saying yes to what your old self desires won't lead to the life the Spirit desires, but what the Spirit desires is really the life you want. So how do you live this out as we wrap up? Let me give you a few suggestions. One is, I would set aside a day this week. I've actually practiced, I practiced this on Monday. I took some, a day to, because of our Pentecost service, I want to take some time to pray and to fast and to call to the Lord to move. And, and so um, Monday I did that. But I also just sensed the Lord say, I want you to say yes to every nudge I give you today. Now you could say, well, you're supposed to do that all the time. Well, have at it. Go for it. And then call me in an hour when you fall flat. Like, why don't you just try a day? And, and you'll still fall flat, but it's a, it's a whole lot easier to get your head around. For this day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes. Yes to whatever he says. I'm not, I'm, don't overeat. Don't yell at your kid. Don't be envious of the person that has something you don't have. 
I mean, just any little nudge. Just practice saying yes, because the more you say yes, your right foot, yes, left foot, yes, you're walking with the Spirit, and before long, you'll have the life that the Spirit desires for you, which is the kind of life you want, full of love, joy, patience, and forbearance, and gentleness, and goodness, and faithfulness, all that stuff. You want that, right? You want to be in relationships like that. Well, just say yes. So on my day Monday, I had some time, so I went to Alley Park, I, I, I hiked, I went up this big rock, I was sweating like a mule. I didn't know they sweated, but that sounded appropriate to say. But, uh, um, I, you know, I, I sit on the rock, I journal, I pray, I'm reading, it's hot, I lay on the rock because it, it's big and, and uh, it's cool. And uh, so I just, I'm resting and having just a good time, just kind of decompressing from busyness the last week or two. And, and I felt this nudge. I, I saw a picture of the small shepherd shelter house, uh, part of the park, and that I was writing on the picnic table, and I just had this nudge, Joel, go right at the picnic table. Is that you, Lord? Yes, go right on the picnic table. I just, I just, and it wasn't, Joel, go to the picnic It was just a, 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 a nudge, just a, God, I'm, I just hiked. I just got up here. I spent a few minutes, but I, I don't, you know, whatever. Okay, I said today, I just say yes to all the nudges. I mean, it was crazy stuff, like, don't go in the short line. Go in the long line. I don't want to go in the long line. I want to go in the short line, you know. But I just thought, okay, I'm going to do this. If we're going to do it, I'm just going to do it all out. Anything you say, I'm going to try to figure out if it's you or not. I'm just going to say yes. So I say, okay, I grab my stuff. I start walking down. I kid you not, I get just to the edge of the trees on the path. I'm, I'm from here to that whiteboard to, a, to that shelter house. And all, all of a sudden, with no warning, Kaboom, the sky's let loose, and it's just raining cats and dogs. Uh, and I, I run in there, and I write at the picnic table some things I felt like the Lord had given me and stuff. And I'm like, Jesus, like, do you really care if I got wet or not? I mean, and it was like, I don't think he did in that. I mean, I think he probably does at times, but that wasn't so much because he cared if I got wet or not. It was, he's just teaching me, are you going to pay attention? Are you going to say yes to what I say yes? Because the life I have for you is better than the one that that, that your flesh desires. I had some solitude for about 10 minutes till Mount Pleasant fifth graders happened to be at Alley Park that day and they came flying out of the woods, drenched like drenched rats. And they came into the, the place with me and I had great conversation with fifth graders. So uh, it's just saying yes. So pick a day this week and just say yes to every nudge of the Holy Spirit and you will begin to learn to walk and say no to anything he says to say no to. You'll be walking with the Spirit, and before long, you'll begin to develop the fruit that he promises. One other thing I would suggest is just continue to keep immersing yourself in the Spirit. Like I said, the Galatians had all of this happening. They, they, the Holy Spirit had allowed them to call God their father, daddy God. They had this intimate relationship with God. They were seeing miracles and gifts being distributed to their church via the Holy Spirit. I would just say, don't let this eight weeks end the Holy Spirit. Like, just because we're going on to other teachings after this week doesn't mean that the life of the Spirit stops in our church, Right? Just keep immersing yourself in the Spirit. Just keep saying yes to the Spirit over and over and over again and see where he leads you. Like if there's a chance to get prayer, get prayer. If there's a chance to pray for somebody else, pray for somebody else. If there's a chance to use a spiritual gift that you have, use it. Keep immersing yourself in the Spirit because in times, and I've been in churches, I've heard lessons like this, I've heard sermons like this. At times I think we, we like say, well, the fruit's the really good stuff of the Spirit, the gifts, that's kind of the surfacey, immature stuff. Not in Paul's mind. It was all together. Like the more you experience the supernatural of the Holy Spirit, the more you experience the gifts of the Spirit. He, he saw that in the life of the Galatians. He would say in Galatians 3, 3 and 4, don't you see the miracles of the Holy Spirit every week in your services, in your life together? He, he, that stuff actually led to them having the fruit. So if you keep stringing together Holy Spirit experiences, the thing that should happen if you're really saying yes to him is you'll see this fruit. It's not just about getting hit with the Spirit and the kind word from the Spirit on Sunday mornings and crying, rah, rah, rah. You know, the Holy Spirit just hitting me. Rah, rah. Okay, that's great if that happens. I, want, I pray that experience happens to you. But what that experience should lead to is you become more loving tomorrow and more joyful and peaceful and forbearing. And you keep stringing together experiences of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't promise you. I think Paul and Jesus promises you. You'll see this fruit in your life. Amen? 
Saying yes to what your old self desires won't lead to the life the Spirit desires. Yet what the Spirit desires is really the life you want. Let's just say yes to the Holy Spirit right now and see what he might do, okay? So let's, we're going to move into a prayer ministry time. We're not going to take long, but let's just see if the, the Lord has anything for us. Let's just wait on him. Come, Holy Spirit, right now. Begin to move in our midst. <laughs>